Hey guys, welcome to the Bunch of Sort Guys monthly meeting. Uh, I guess technically we're in November, but it's also technically the October one. Uh, it's just fun 2020 stuff as always. Um, glad everyone could be here to make it. Uh, thank you for everyone for joining us. I'm going to share my screen to go through a few little notes we have, guys. Uh, so just as an FYI, this is a bunch of sort guys uh, group uh, where we talk about art. And, you know, no matter how much craziness is in the world, you know, we just talk about art and we try to, you know, stay focused on creatives and getting everyone's voices out there. Um, just to give you a little past history, we've been doing monthly meetings uh, in YouTube for basically since May. And before then, uh, we were doing live events uh, at different places around Dallas and uh, little social gatherings, parties, uh, studio events. Um, and every year we come together for a big convention that, you know, 2020 has kind of put a halter on some of this, but uh, hopefully we will be able to get back to some of this very soon. Um, hopefully in 2021, we'll have something like this. If not, we'll just keep on doing the virtual thing and getting everyone's voices heard. Um, where we will have more portfolio reviews coming up. Uh, one of the things we were, we are still building up to is an industry giants. And that's what leads us into Cameron's talk today. Uh, Cameron was the artist behind our next industry giants um, convention. Uh, he was the artist we picked to basically come up with this amazing poster art for us uh, to announce to the world that, yes, we are still going to have an industry giants. Uh, we're still working toward that. And this is an amazing work that he had done for us. Um, most of our talk today will be about that. Sorry, one sec, I switched my screens right before we started. Uh, I do want to also mention, guys, if you guys have any questions, suggestions, or you know, you wanted your art just to be seen, we have over, I think we have over 3,000, uh, or no, we have 1,400 members, sorry, uh, in the Short Guys group. I think we have another 1,400 members in our um, actual official webpage, uh, but we have professional artists, students, uh, people, you know, looking to mentor and get mentee on here. So feel free to post up your work and show us what you're working on anytime, okay? Or if you got any questions, you know, let us know. Uh, we also got our Bunch of Short Guys website where you can get a bunch of news about us. Or if you want to see it on our past meetings, just go to our YouTube at a Bunch of Short Guys uh, YouTube. Um, with that being said, um, I do want to just introduce everyone. Uh, if y'all can just say hi, Cameron, you can just say hi to the yeah. group. How's it going? Uh, How's it going? I'm so, Saturday. Thanks for doing this for us today. Um, so Cameron, like I said, we, you know, we asked him about a year ago if he could start working on the artwork for um, a bunch of short guys, industry giants, and he agreed to that. Um, and then we started looking through his portfolio. Um, we saw he has an amazing plethora of work that we just basically wanted to set this talk up and um, get to know about him. So with that, Cameron, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, whenever I was growing up, I uh, always wanted to do art, always wanted to be paid to, to make drawings and paintings. And so when I started getting into video games, uh, I realized that kind of my two passions just combined naturally there because uh, I love I love playing games, love computers, and I love uh make an art and I wanted to go into that professionally and so I remember seeing like the uh, concept art for Destiny and just Jamie Jones's paintings for that game just blew me away and so over several years I uh, went to different schools like university settings but I finally found a school that really clicked for me it was just a trade school in Cedar Park called Gemini School of Visual Arts and there I worked under uh, several really actually really big time concept artists as well as uh, 3D artists uh, as well as having a classical foundational training in painting with acrylics and oils and drawing with charcoal and pencil and uh, that upbringing just kind of artistically 
uh, it was very kind of retro, very old school illustration, almost European model, the atelier model of kind of going through and learning to draw and paint for two years traditionally, and then spending two years doing digital and 3D. And from that, uh, I just got a really good foundation at, that I'd been missing when I was going through the university system, trying to learn basically a model that they weren't teaching, which was representational figurative art. And after school, I was uh, fortunate to go work at Picture Plane. And Picture Plane makes uh, key art, which is basically promotional advertising art. It's a big consumer facing images, like on the poster or on the box art for a video game or a movie. And uh, that was a really fun experience. I got to work on some really interesting projects. Uh, we did some pitch work for one of the uh, Elder Scrolls games. Uh, we did the actual box design for Death Loops, which is coming out, I think, late 2021. Uh, did some stuff for uh, Ghost Recon, for uh, XCOM, just a lot of fun, fun projects for really uh, cool games that I played myself. And after that, uh, I've just, I ended up being laid off because that's the nature of the industry and anytime that they got to make cuts the newest guys are kind of I start looking at those guys first so I uh, found myself in a position where I was freelancing and I really love the lifestyle and the, the kind of work workflow just the way that you manage yourself be your own boss and uh, it's it's been fun and it's been it kind of happened that I guess the right time with the way that's sort of where everything was going now working from home so freelance has been great but it's very different from working in a studio so i just really kind of enjoyed learning the different perspectives and outlooks on work and culture just doing both of those and i think for now i, I really like doing freelance and i've gotten to work for uh, some architecture companies who have been pitching some really futuristic projects. So I've got to do some Sydney kind of science fiction style paintings. And uh, recently I did some work for a video game, a sci-fi video game being made right now. And so that's my bread and butter, you know, just getting to do kind of fantastical science fiction futurism stuff. Uh, but that brings us up to the present and things are, are going strong and I'm really loving it. That's great, man. Um, yeah, like I said, I really appreciate you coming in and showing off your work. Um, I'm going to yeah, stop sharing my screen and let you do some breakdowns for us of some of your past work. Sure. All right, let me go ahead and get this set up on my end. Real quick. And yeah, I totally forgot that you had been working on that Deathloop game. I'm really excited to work on that or play on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see uh, how that turns out and what it looks like in the end. Do you by chance know the release date on that? I do not. I think it's in early development. So it's probably going to be a little while. Okay. Um, but I will keep y'all posted with any details because I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes myself. So yeah, I'd be really learn anything. I'll pass it along. Yeah, I'll definitely share it on the short guys website. Cool. Yeah, I got to do a lot of work for them. Like, and they were they're pretty much like, hey, we have no idea what this thing is going to look like. We're just going to push that all to you, and mm -hmm. you can feel that and figure all that out. So it was it was cool kind of getting to art direct a little bit at the same time as, you know, just figuring out what things were going to be kind of from the ground up. Uh, but can you guys see this right now? The fire yeah. Stuff? Uh, I will okay. say one thing real fast. Uh, guys, if you got questions, again, either use the YouTube chat or if you're in the Zoom call, you can use the Zoom chat. We'll be taking little breaks for some questions, but we'll definitely do a big Q&A toward the end of the talk, okay? Cool. All right, well, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, all right, so I have uh, a little bit of a, a lesson or just yeah, okay, we'll call it a lesson. I have just a little thing to touch on that I use throughout this process of arriving at this poster design here. So, and this is something that I wanted to mention to y'all. I actually 
think there's a lot of value right now, especially in doing mentorships. If you know an artist that you respect, that you really want to work with, or that you would like to learn from, uh, if you can find out if they're doing mentorships, like that is such an enormous advantage of living in 2020 or you know, 2018. The current, the current day, we have that huge advantage of being connected all the time through the internet, through Zoom, through Google Hangouts, whatever. Um, and so there's an artist, actually, I'm going to share some of his work really quickly. Uh, there's an artist that I am a big fan of uh, named Devin Corwin. And hang on really quick. That's all good. Devin's art just really fast. Uh, and I sought Devin out, and he was doing mentorships. Uh, and I went ahead and decided when I got the offer to do the poster, uh, I decided I wanted to work with Devin uh, through a mentorship and learn from him. Uh, and I wanted that to kind of color the process of designing this poster and have a big impact on it. And Devin is a very classical uh, kind of figurative painter but he is like really old school and very direct approach. That's very much like oil painting or uh, traditional drawing. And he does a lot of that stuff. But something I loved about his work that I wanted to do was just how simple it is and how descriptive it is at the same time. And so that's why I sought him out because I thought he had really good graphic design skills. I thought he had an interesting way of painting and looking at things and compressing information and that was just something that resonated with me and i wanted to see if i could learn that from him and take it into future work and i had a great opportunity with uh, the poster design to be able to do that uh, so i'm gonna go ahead and go back to photoshop really quick uh, the point of that is just to say if you have an artist that you you know would like to to learn from them one-on-one -on -one, just I would recommend asking them and seeing if that's something they do. Right now, a lot of people especially are doing extra things on the side to make a little bit more money. So uh, that has been enormously helpful for me. It's great doing Learn Square and YouTube tutorials, but doing this experience with another pair of eyes uh, helped me very uniquely uh, to learn kind of about my blind spots and what I was doing that I could be doing better. Uh, so anyway, uh, I have a few thumbnails here just from the start of this process, and I did a lot more, uh, but these are just a few that I didn't end up going with. But these are some ideas that I thought might work well as poster designs, uh, specifically just because you, know, you can kind of like have some text or something in this space uh, or in here, you know, like whatever. I don't know. Uh, but the idea is that I'm trying to find a layout that kind of lends itself to uh just sort of getting the information out there like height specifically and uh have a little bit of kind of a block down here where i can simplify some and then kind of a dominant block up here and same kind of thing down here and i was just experimenting with things just kind of get something cool going uh that would be a nice backdrop and that i could kind of put some information on and that kind of thing like keep some keep some gaps uh, and also do a horizontal and a vertical crop because uh, that's whenever I was a picture thing, it was a big part of the, the key art that we did was you can move stuff around, but you should be doing the, the entire image and understanding that there's going to be different crops and that they should accommodate uh, kind of a unique aspect ratio while still being able to present all the information. So these were three other thumbnails that I did and I actually put some pipe on top of them. But these were the three that I liked well enough to take to the next stage. Um, and that that's where I'm gonna switch over really quick and talk a little bit about uh, the idea or the concept of focusing on things in your work. Uh, because my when I was a student, what I struggled with a lot was uh, sort of a feedback loop between focus and having confidence. And what I mean by that is you'll do a bunch of thumbnail designs, you'll have a bunch of ideas, and you have to pick one. Like you have to pick a, a central idea or a theme or a composition or a color. Every time that you decide, you know, you're going to do something a certain way, you have to, you have to make a decision. You have to pick something. And with concept art, you can always, you can always edit things. There's always iterations. 
but especially with an illustration like this, you are you're moving towards a final image. And you want it to be the best design it can be. You want it to be uh, the best uh, overall impact that it can be. And you have to be making decisions the whole time and focusing on the idea that you want to convey. And because you're going to be eliminating the other ideas you had that you're not pursuing, uh, you have to have confidence in your key ideas that you're moving forward with. And whenever you start out, I think it's a lot of times tricky to uh, really zero in on and focus on your ideas because some of them are very unproven because you don't have the mileage or the experience. And even experienced artists, uh, I think indecision is something that eats into your time and that causes you to spin your wheels more than anything. Um, but as you as you do more paintings, as you start and finish more paintings, uh, you get more of an intuition about where you where you want to focus your attention, and your efforts, and how you want to focus your attention, and your efforts to tell the story that you want to tell. Uh, but through doing that and just getting those miles in and getting that experience, I think that process solidifies more. So as you move forward, you know you have basically you're constantly cutting yourself or funneling yourself more in the direction that you want to like you want to go uh and it's it's almost like a rule of thirds thing where it constantly is overlapping and sort of informing where you're going to go next so you know rule of thirds is just and this is a really crude example but rule of thirds is this idea that you've kind of got 70 percent here there you go that's a very beautiful little box uh, that's 70 percent and then you've got 30 percent here and the idea is that you kind of break up your shapes and your design just to be uh, less balanced and less kind of predictable and just more organic and more interesting. And, you know, that's the Fibonacci sequence is that eventually it, it just continues going indefinitely and you keep cutting that down and you keep cutting that down and it just goes on forever until, you know, you just have this one, uh, this one little space of light here, and that just goes on infinitely with uh, the rule of thirds Fibonacci sequence thing. But by that same token, whenever you are working and you're, you're kind of narrowing your options and making choices, you continue to sort of say, you know, okay, so this is this small area is the one that I'm focusing on. This stuff, all these options I have, because I could paint anything, I could do anything, I could have any composition, but for the story I want to tell, this thing I've chosen suits it best. And so you're cutting yourself off from that. And then you do it again, and you're constantly just removing more chaff and just keeping the wheat. And by the end of it, you had all these options you could have done, but this is the actual intentional design that you've made. And so it's just narrowing down kind of your net and zeroing in on the thing that matters that you want to say that's going to help that design communicate your ideas clearly. So that's all, that's all good and fine. Uh, and it probably seems pretty obvious, uh, but the flip side of focus and confidence is uh, option paralysis and decision fatigue. And what those are is option paralysis is pretty much what it sounds like, where you have all these options. You can do anything you want. You can do a car in a Sydney environment. You can do some robots duking it out on Mars. You can do uh, this nice little spark cottage scene. And it's so overwhelming. A lot of people call it kind of like the blank canvas. Like, you know, it's very intimidating to have this big white canvas. and you can do anything you want, and it always causes you to seize up and kind of clam up and not know what it is that you want to do. And so that is a thing that plants a lot of kind of doubt once you start working. You think, like, oh, is this, I'm trying to make an awesome piece of, of key art or an awesome poster. Is this really going in the best direction? Because you can do anything. And so as you, as you go in and feel more intimidated by that, you're going to have decision fatigue. Because as you continue having to make those choices and kind of siphon down uh, those possibilities in that net, you're, you're sacrificing all the other thumbnails, all the other avenues, all the other ways you could go as you get closer to what you're actually going to have as the final image. Uh, and 
so if you don't have strong confidence and you don't have a lot of purpose in what it is that you're doing, what's informed in the decisions you're making, as you make choices, you'll continue to actually get physically tired. Uh, it'll become more exhausting. And it's just, it's when I was starting out, like even just working on a painting, it, even if it went well for a while, I would feel like, oh, okay, that's, that's enough for now. Like I would want to step back. I would just feel like, okay, I'm at a good stopping point because some good things happened. Uh, I, I sort of want to just go get, you know, a drink or separate myself from a little while, which that's not what you want. You want when you get those choices that start adding up and things start clicking and the pain starts coming together, you want that momentum to carry you forward. And as you do more painting, it will, uh, when you're still kind of getting your, your legs about things, it is more exhausting and it just takes more time. But ultimately, I just want to communicate that it's completely natural to, to scrutinize and look at your, your thumbnails and your designs and your sketches and say, hmm, I don't think, I don't know if I have confidence in, in this one. And that's a very healthy part of the process. And that's why this stage is so important uh, is because as you do make these choices and do these things and decide what you want to focus on, uh, it becomes more intuitive and it becomes uh, more energizing and as you do that, you start to build your voice as an artist, just as a storyteller. Because when I was looking at this, I was looking at the Sid Mead style one, and I got some just some color reference and some treatment treatment reference. And Sid Mead had passed away recently. Whenever uh, I was offered this uh, poster design, and so one of the ideas was a tribute to Sid Mead, and so that's a pretty clear focus. Uh, and as for you know the actual composition, I just wanted sort of a, a cool Sid Mead car. And characters, uh, you know, like getting out, maybe, uh, you know, dressed nicely like they're out from out on the town, and then this really cool, big, bustling cityscape. And these are very graphic, very simple thumbnails. And it's important that you work this way at the beginning just because as you make these choices, you're going to make some bad choices and some good ones. And you don't want to spend a lot of time with, uh, with choices that don't pan out. And so I got this one, which I liked, uh, but I was obviously exploring other options. And I did this kind of mech warrior inspired thing just because I think robots are really cool. And I was looking for something cool and something that would be tense and kind of be an action scene. And so I explored some of that. Uh, and just focusing on lighting and graphic shapes, a lot of shape design, uh, and just doing a, a, a lot of kind of 70-30 relationship stuff about having some big shapes and small shapes uh, and some medium sized shapes. And then lastly, I just kind of thought maybe something a little bit mellow. Uh, it was obviously kind of a, a stress-inducing time. So just sort of a little bit of kind of sparky-inspired um, landscape, beautiful hills and, and a little refinery out there in uh, this, this big forested area. And I presented these to uh, the the group of them short guys and this one really resonated with them and i thought it was really cool i was happy with it and i decided that i wanted to move forward with that and immediately the elements that i liked about this that i wanted to focus on was sort of this idea of these two big bulking like the human robots uh kind of coming together and facing down one another not really knowing exactly what was going to happen like they're not in the middle of like firing off a bunch of missiles or anything but sort of like two giant like big animals at a watering hole uh that might kind of get into a confrontation with one another uh, and as that idea kind of took off uh it started to inform sort of the way i was thinking of it and i approached it kind of like a western uh i there was a, a piece of art from um, once upon a time in the west actually that uh sort of was the basis uh, hang on, I'm going to bring this up really quick. And it was sort of the basis of the overall composition. Here we go. And this is a, here it is right here. So I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to share this screen right here. So this poster right here, if y'all can see this, uh, was sort of just this character down here, kind of. Uh, smaller and back in the distance and then these characters up here kind of the antagonizers uh 
than just this tension with them. And then here you can pretty much see he's fanning, he's fanning the hammer on this revolver. But I thought that was just a really cool, awesome cinematic camera angle to really heighten the tension. And so I'll get back to Photoshop. Um, so I went ahead and brought that in here uh, just to go ahead and sort of bring that cinematic uh, tension that I wanted. And here that is right there. I'll just put it right next to it. And uh, this guy is you know, the smaller one and this dude. And eventually, uh, initially I had a few over here. So I kind of flipped the strip. I had the one here and then the three over here. But just compositionally, it worked better to have one. Um, but anyway, in this stage, I've moved from kind of these very just big graphic shapes. I've moved into trying to kind of design some of what this robot is going to look like, which I did in uh, another project that uh, I worked on around the same time, which I'll actually bring that up really quick, just the designs of the robots. Um, and that is... Hey, Cam hey Cameron, yeah. uh, by chance, do you have a window open or maybe a door to your room open? Can you close that if uh, possible? Um, no, it's, it's actually really, there's a fan on, but it's on very gently. Okay. Um, is there some kind of thing y'all are hearing? There's some, there's some crosstalk, but, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's anything we can do. Uh, it's all good. Don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but these are kind of some designs that I did. And I also did these whenever I was doing my mentorship and this was just sort of figuring out like what these robots are going to look like. And I was using a lot of Blender, which I still do. I'm a huge advocate for Blender. Uh, but these were just some rough mech designs that I did just through randomized, uh, randomized transform in Blender, which means you can just get a bunch of shapes and make one of these, like make this thing right here. And then you can very subtly tweak it and let Blender run through a whole bunch of different little variations. So I did that with guns. I did that with robots. And then I just like tweaked them myself and sort of figured out just some cool designs. And I ended up going with this guy for the dude in the background and this guy for the one in the foreground. And these have been modified, uh, but these were the ideas that I was rolling with. And so let's get back to Photoshop. Here we go. And so anyway, you can kind of see those, like this dude being the, the Doughboy design that I had. And then I just started uh, painting some of this in. And over here, you can see the graphic shapes are, they all hold, they're all the same, which is a good thing to get set up really, really quickly because like these buildings, uh, having them kind of at an angle, like maybe there's an earthquake or just, you know, they've been ravaged by time and plagues, whatever, just this dystopian future where God knows what has happened. They've become completely unset in their foundation. And I thought that was a cool look. And it's something that you can immediately get just with a flat brush and black and white over here. And obviously this is this is simple stuff, but it is extremely useful to just keep that always at the forefront of your mind. You're trying to just get as much out of as few marks as you can. So just for uh, you know conveying space, uh, just look at the scale of kind of these shadows and just sort of as the, the landscape widens and goes out, you get a higher frequency of information. And then as it comes out, you're seeing things that the scale is changing. And so you're getting uh, more space in between these elements. And always looking for little ways to push that, that sense of scale and that sense of space, uh, especially at the start, is, is hugely beneficial later on down the line. And so then we got here and I had this big structure. I didn't know exactly what this was, but just kind of a big overhang. Uh, which for whatever reason I kind of liked it compositionally over here to get that negative space kind of popping out that uh, kind of change and counter change between the black and the white. Uh, but as I kept moving with it, I decided that it was kind of kind of claustrophobic and it was sort of not doing what I wanted for the image. And so I went ahead and just removed it entirely, brought these buildings up a little bit and brought this water uh, throughout this scene that just kind of divides these characters and just sort of heightens the tension as well as just provides a good compositional element. And at this point, I have a nice space down here. And that's something else I should mention is that I'm always in the context of this piece because it is a poster and to have information that I'm gonna have to relay to people. I'm always, whoops, I'm just thinking about 
uh, kind of my, my spaces, gaps where I can make a poster. So here, like I'm actually thinking of doing props, you know, like this, like here's some information, uh, here's some information. And uh, then if I widen that out a little bit here and shift these elements, I can go ahead and figure out what I'm gonna do exactly. But if I need to do a banner design, I can then do something like this and have kind of a, a simple spot that I can simplify some of these buildings, but have some room here, uh, some room here, and that kind of thing. And so that's just something I'm always thinking about, and it's influencing my decision making. So I do simplify a lot of this stuff from where it was over here. I get all this kind of junk out of there. And this is a lot of simplification. Uh, it's just it helps with the painting and the clarity of the painting. But because there's going to be information over it, it's actually going to help one another. It's simplifying the good for painting, and it's also really good for making text stand out. Uh, so those things just kind of continue to nail down elements in the painting. And between these two stages, this is where I learned a lot from my mentorship, because as I'm, as I'm doing those things and figuring out, you know, where I want those things to be, uh, Devin was telling me a lot about how to paint natural light or how to paint sunlight. And so, uh, for instance, over here, uh, these two colors, the gap between where the light is hitting that color and then where it's in shadow, um, just understanding better how that stuff works and what those changes look like. Uh, if you want to be a really convincing environment painter, that's an enormous thing. What you want is sunlight, for instance, is just a really quick thing. Sunlight will bleach out colors and it will generally uh, cool them down. Uh, just because the way sunlight works is white light and the wavelength that it works on is that it actually cools down and desaturates color. Uh, so not only where you get, you know, you go from shadow, which is very saturated uh, to light, which is going to be more desaturated, not not always entirely. In some of these areas that are pumped it up, uh, but here especially, like between these two, so it's going to go up in value and in saturation. That it's going to desaturate quite a lot. And also, if you look over here, you can see right here this little guy. You can see that in the darkness, it's down closer to red and orange, and then as you go cooler, it goes up towards yellow and green, which is just cooling down. So at the same time that that value is going up, the color is also becoming and slightly desaturated, and also the temperature of the color is actually even cooler. And that's not a steadfast rule that you have to adhere to. Uh, you can absolutely uh, break that just to get kind of more vibrant colors. But here especially, uh, going from here to this little section that's actually really, it's just a, a flattened kind of beveled edge there. Uh, it's like a dent, and so it's actually pointing directly up towards the sun as opposed to this, which is kind of pointing out. Uh, that absolutely, that's uh, going to be more saturated. And then over here, that's going to get cooler and less saturated. But anyway, that's that's just something that is really hammered in uh, by what we talked about. But you'll find all kinds of things that you'll learn just about how to paint the way you want to paint, working with other people and working with tutorials. But as I as I start to tighten that down and make those choices, because up to now it's all been compositional choices and choices to set the stage. And then as you get to this stage, you're moving into an entirely different range of choices about how to get into materials and how to actually treat like okay, so this is chip paint, this is sand, this is like glass, uh, this is water. And just the way that you treat different materials is really going to take your paintings to the next level because it's going to make them feel like they're not just all like photoshoppy black red paint, but that they are materials that exist in the natural world. And so at this stage, the design choice making is done, but the decision making on a painting on a more artistic level really begins where you're getting into the nitty gritty and starting to render and starting to actually work out how this this lighting situation and these colors are going to behave on it one another. And then from there, it's pretty simple. Uh, I went ahead and added in uh, some distress marks to uh, go ahead and really vibe off the idea of like a book cover. Uh, and that was always the plan, was to do something kind of in the style of kind of like Fallout, you know, something uh, Flash Gordon kind of future, you know, stories from after the end times kind of thing. Uh, and it's just, a process of you know kind of finding 
uh, all all the, the little tidbits that you can squeeze squeezing juice out of to, to make the painting gel better. Which, for instance, in here in the foreground, uh, just grabbing a little bit of that that lighter pink, which I think this happened because I had some transparency going on and I used the mixer gel. But grabbing just some of that warm kind of pink or red from that robot, and then just mixing that into the, the focal point or the foreground, the, focal point, the foreground. That's actually one of my favorite elements of the painting. Is just that it ties that together. Because if you just want this bright color and then that's not repeated anywhere else, it just sort of it does absolutely stand out as a focal point, but it doesn't ground it quite as much. So it's just little things, like little choices that as you get more mileage and as you build up the intuition, making little decisions like that to do those sorts of things. Uh, really influences the depth and just sort of uh, the world building in your painting, whether or not it's a one and done illustration or it's a series of images uh, for some concept art. But the process of all this from start to finish definitely hinges, like I was saying, just on that decision making. And in repeating that and going through that multiple times, you will build up an intuition and a voice of how you want to do that moving forward as an artist. And that'll affect your entire portfolio. That won't only affect, you know, one piece that you're working on. If you happen to be thinking about that while you're working, that'll affect everything you do. Uh, and once you have a bigger body of work built up, and that body of work is uh, more present and more contemporary, it's going to it's going to gel and it's going to absolutely voice to employers and to other artists and anyone that looks at your portfolio that you do have a uh, a tight line of decision making that you go through, and that you're you're ultimately following through that process, uh, which is reliable, which is consistent, and arrives at the best design for you. And that'll help you tell stories. That'll help you uh, just make aesthetically pleasing compositions without context. And it'll help you form the body of work with the voice and the intent that you want people to see when they look at your work. At what point were you like really setting your goal for this image, like this, and even like the story that you were trying to go for? Yeah, uh, were so, you were you changing that every five minutes, or were you from the get go? No, yeah, that's that's something that right here at the beginning, uh, I didn't quite have the the exact idea. Like I wanted to kind of vibe off sort of a western kind of kind of composition and and narrative quite yet. But I had these two elements that uh, just had a lot of tension with one another and that were facing one another down, kind of this sort of aggressive uh, interaction between these two giant you know, war machines. And I just thought that was really cool. And I liked that tension and that, that aggression and just that overall composition. And so that narrative was already set as, uh, and I remember thinking about it there's a, a lot of dinosaur paintings from this historical illustration that have like a T-Rex like sitting on a stegosaurus. Because those things have, they have a lot of armor and they have spikes on these massive, enormously strong tails. And so even though, you know, you think the T-Rex is going to win, he has to size that thing up and circle around it very cautiously. And a lot of, uh, a lot of historical illustration of dinosaurs and stuff that I've seen growing up just really well illustrated that tension was. Like one of these guys is clearly the one uh, to be more more conventionally reckoned with. Like one of these, like the T-Rex is, is the more serious uh, of the two here, but you never know what's gonna happen. There is absolutely a lot of tension there and I wanted to capitalize on that. And then as I started to flush things out, I just thought kind of some of the, uh, some of the elements here uh, specifically in my mind, almost this black spot right here, just this, this shape right here. I'll just go ahead. This just shape almost feels almost like a cape to me. Uh, and I really like kind of the gesture of this thing. And I think it just kind of took on sort of like this sand and, you know, sort of this, these wires and this just, uh, not wires necessarily, but everything kind of being, uh, falling apart and kind of ramshackle. It made me think of like a town that was in a drought, you know, that uh, everyone had left, everyone had moved out, uh, except for the people that, you know, maybe owned the bar. They had businesses there, they couldn't leave. And so these characters became 
sort of these drifters in the scene, and that kind of informed the Western thing. And so from the second iteration of the black and white graphic thumbnail, I was completely sold on that idea. And moving forward, uh, I just did everything I could to inform the narrative with sort of this environment without becoming too uh, invasive. Uh, with this environment, it's just kind of dry, arid, uh, region, there's this little spot of water going through it, but these two guys were both there uh, around this kind of, this little stream, and they were both, like, they, this was their world, and they were going to face off here, and that was just kind of what I moved forward with from that point, but from a very early spot, uh, I knew ultimately the main idea, and then sort of the, the western thing was a flavor that I think I kind of added to that, but you want to absolutely have your narrative, your story from the get-go. Because as a student, I did change my story a lot of the time. And that is how you just work infinitely on a painting, changing things. Because as you change the narrative, you're not going to think much of it, but you're going to change uh, just an object or a character or something. It's actually going to change the graphic of design, the overall aesthetic design. You're going to move things around to better tell the story. And all of a sudden, now maybe there's more of a story, but your graphic design has been really fundamentally flawed. And so then you redesign the graphic design. And then the next day you look at it and you think, yeah, that story actually isn't that strong. I thought it was really cool at the time, but it's not as good as I thought. And so I sank two days into reworking it. And now I think I'm just going to do it all over again. And that's not where you want to be. And everyone who's like done big narrative paintings has done that like a hundred times. Uh, but as, as soon as you can, from the earliest stage, you know, figure out what you want to do and just everything else should be in service of that. And I know that was a really long answer. For future questions, I'll keep it much shorter. I apologize. I'm kind of, I'm kind of wondering You're on good. You're good, completely. I love the mental work that you put into this and just kind of the, the thought process that you're showing us here. Um, is this what you what you trained in when you were doing your when your mentorship yeah uh with the mentorship uh unfortunately i don't have uh, all the paintings i did but what we actually did together a lot of them were on the ipad and i hadn't switched them over uh but i did a lot of black and white um just black and white graphic studies and uh devin was really big devin was actually i think he was a graphic designer like in uh like doing a lot of product uh, packaging design and things of that nature. And then, and it, you used to be able to see this on his personal website. He had some of those like actual product packaging that he designed out, which we did some of that at picture point too. But he was uh, a graphic designer first and foremost, and he loved painting. Uh, this is what I understand. And he really dedicated himself to learning as a painter and went to, um, uh, went and studied at the Florence Atelier, uh, and he has some some personal gripes to sort of the more academic teachings, and so he decided he was going to like rebuild a lot of that from the ground up, with also an eye for digital art and the like concept art perspective. And on his uh, Gumroad, which you can you can check out his uh, hang on, if you Google Devin Corwin Gumroad, you can see uh, he has two books, two PDFs about kind of his ultimate lessons on painting both of those pick them up like they are incredible uh, they are so concise so condensed so much in, just amazing information in those two pdfs uh but with him what i what i really uh, learned was just about taking a very graphic design approach and a very basic approach and not not you know getting into the details too early which is again something you hear a lot but having kind of someone guide you through that and you kind of witness yourself how that works through a back and forth with them, them doing some paint over stuff, uh, you doing the new design, them critiquing that and just having that one on one relationship gives like kind of a story and a personal experience to that lesson. That if you just read something, you'll get the lesson, but you might not if you're like me and you're kind of dense and you have to kind of have more personal context. Uh, that helped a lot but just from a graphic design perspective. And then once you approach it with a graphic design perspective, you hear all the time people talk about simplifying your painting, uh, keeping, you know, keeping finishing into detail and just putting detail where you want the focal point to be. 
uh, and simplifying everything else. And that's both for time and for this aesthetic. But if you do approach painting with a more graphic eye, simplification is, is really just graphic design. I mean, it, it really is. And so that whole workflow helped a lot with that. When you uh, would ask for feedback, for instance, from your mentorships or from your colleagues or anybody, because like you said, it helps to have kind of just some guidance or, yeah. you know, especially when you're working on your own and we're all working on our own right now. Right. Um, I'm interested on kind of how you would actually wordsmith your questions and actually know that you're asking a good question that's not that gets to a specific or gets elicits a specific response or answer or direction. Because um, I mean, uh, what kind of questions did you ask Devin? Like, uh, did you just ask him, hey, here's what I'm doing. What did you think? Or really like get into things that you got stuck on? Yeah. Um, that's a good question, actually, right there. Uh, just speaking of questions, uh, one thing that I did that I think is, is just really good to do as both a learning experience and just to kind of humble yourself as a person is if I was working on this painting or any other painting and there were weaknesses in it that I knew about, that I thought maybe if I didn't say anything, other people wouldn't pick up on, which like we all have that, you know, we see a thing and you think, eh, that could be better, but I'm just kind of hope no one sees it. I would immediately go to those things. Like I would say, you know, hey, uh, there's something kind of wonky going on right here that I don't know if it's just me, but it, it's bugging me. And he would say like, yeah, that's, there's there's definitely, you know, a perspective issue there. Or, oh yeah, there's, there's a big value issue there. Uh, and so just kind of letting your intuition tell you like, this is a problem area. And then letting your pride keep you from sort of trying to be like, look at this cool thing I did. Like I worked really hard on it. Just coming in and saying, hey, I know this is the thing that sucks and I really want us to make it better and I want to learn why I couldn't do it myself so that the next time it happens uh, it will be better but also about kind of tailoring questions when I was talking with Devin and he was instructing me um, there were certain things that I could tell were really important to him that he would latch on to a word he used a lot was precise and You've heard, you've probably heard people talk in concept art about whenever you paint a thing, they might say, paint the essence of the thing. Don't worry so much about painting a tree, but paint the essence of a tree. Like paint what a tree looks like, but you don't necessarily set out to paint a tree. And that, that might sound really bizarre and uh, very ambiguous, but what it essentially means is painting a tree, there's a lot of details there that are gonna take you a long time and instead of painting that thing, be precise enough to look at a tree and say, what makes it look the way it does? Like what visual cues, like little occlusion shadows of art, or like little hard like apple shadows of art, just the branches kind of having a harmony, just the way uh, that they move out, kind of like how, how much space is there between where branches branch off, just that kind of thing. And so I would sort of ask him, uh, you know, if I was looking at a, a thing that felt kind of manufactured or contrived or whatever, I might just say, how would you kind of describe this, this thing with more precision when I say describe on your paint? Uh, and then he would say, yeah, no, this, this could definitely have more of that essence. So this could be more precise. And so then he would show me like, that's how you would paint like a rock. Or if you want uh, a thing of surface to look like metal or glass, here's how you can do that. And so sort of know the person that you're taking a mentorship from, know what they value. And if you're taking a mentorship with them, then you hopefully value a lot of the same things. And so if you're gonna push those, then just sort of get on their level and just say, hey, this could be more precise. And they'd say, yes, it could. And they'll help you do that. And from that, you'll learn a big part of their entire philosophy, which is uh, to be precise in the way you paint and to be able to paint different materials and different things efficiently and quickly. And so that was just something helpful, kind of to be, to think about painting the way they do and tailor your questions just to cut right to the immediate issue and don't make them think too much of you like, he's using, what does he mean? And trying to trying to get in his headspace, you kind of meet them in their headspace because they're the one that's teaching you. You want to think more like him already, which is why you're taking lessons, so. Which sounds like you could also apply that quite well to your teachers and anywhere and your clients yeah like, absolutely we're hiring you to do a job absolutely yeah 
And it's a good way to talk about art too, because half of, you know, half of making the art or half of working as an artist is also just communicating with clients and working on that just dialogue and making sure that whatever needs to be said up front is said so that when you go and take all the time to make the art, uh, you guys are on the same page. So just being able to talk with people and meet them kind of in their headspace and the way that they are thinking instead of kind of trying to meet in the middle or even have them come meet you on your terms is definitely a way to go. Right, because they have something to contribute too, even if they're yeah. not necessarily an artist. If they're like the expert or the, the content creator or something like that, it's going to be very important to make sure that we kind of humble or are humble enough to just go to yeah. them. And being humble, I think, is like, I, I know it's a very celebrated thing in art. Uh, and so it's not like a, a new thing to say being humble is, is very, very critical and crucial. But it's one of those bleed over things that I think you can do, you can learn as an artist that actually makes you a better person. Uh, and anytime you can find those things that like learning to do this as an artist can actually bleed over into the things that you do every day outside of art. Those are kind of like life philosophy things that I think actually help you grow as a person and define who you are. And if you can merge who you are as an artist and your philosophy of being an artist with your philosophy of, I don't know, being a, a, a dad or being a baseball player or being a hobbyist and like making models or doing anything. They just kind of take that into your daily life. Uh, that's, that's just something that I think is really cool about doing something as personal as art. Great. Hey, well said. Hey, Cameron, I wanted to ask you, um, earlier you mentioned uh, you were working at Picture Plane and you've worked at a couple of studios, but over the last year, uh, you, you know, as a lot of people have, they've moved to either working at home or just a straight up freelance uh, type of workflow. Um, how has your communications changed, you know, how, uh, especially when getting your takes, but also, you know, letting the clients know what you're working on? You know, I, I just kind of want to get in your headspace from a concept artist, you know, uh, working from home versus working at the studio with somebody on, you know, scheduled meetings every few hours, you know, things like that. Um, what's yeah. the difference? Um, I, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to upset anyone at, uh, I don't, I don't name any places or anything, but honestly, uh, I'm not going to say anything that's going to cut into anyone, but my experience of working at home and just communicating via emails and phone calls is actually that I get better feedback and I, I kind of feel like I'm, I almost have a better relationship than whenever I was in a studio with a bunch of people. I don't know if that's just because you're kind of one-on-one, -on -one, but when you're in a studio, or maybe this is a freelance thing too, but when I was in a studio, we had like a bunch of meetings that I didn't think I needed to be in on and that didn't really have anything to do with me. And this is like personal stuff is my opinion. Everyone has opinions about where they work and they're like, I want to get back to work. I'm doing this thing that's important. But there really is like everything when you're working in the studio is kind of a one size fits all solution where you are kind of just you're just doing the same thing as everyone else. There's a meeting, it really, you know, there's like six people in the office that need to be in on it. A lot of the time they just bring in the whole team and you just sort of, you know, sit there quietly and wait. And then whenever it's time for you to get back to work and you actually need to get feedback, just because there is so much of that kind of, you know, all hands on deck thing. It's so, it's, it's very busy and hard to actually get people to talk to you because everyone's doing so much. And I don't really know how that would change if I was just emailing someone or calling them on the phone, but being a freelancer and kind of being on the outside, I feel like I just get some more direct communication and personal communication. Also probably because if they're paying you by the day or by the hour, they want to communicate with you as much as possible. And so I don't know if that's part of it, but I felt as a freelancer, like working by emailing people and uh, calling them on the phone, just there's been, almost better communication than being in a studio. And that's one studio that I've worked at. One studio, which was actually a very good experience, but every rose has its thorns. And that was one of them. 
was that there was just a lot of meetings that took up a lot of time and there were there were offices in Texas and in California and some of the people in California just like to talk a lot and they like to catch up on things that didn't really pertain to the work and there were times where we'd be like staying after hours because there were just like too much kind of talking going on that had nothing to do with the project and that's just a studio thing that's just it like there's that's and and you're going to find that anywhere and you know more or less and then you're going to be a freelancer and you're going to email someone and they're just not going to email you back for days at a time and so it just depends on you know who you're talking with i'm sorry if that didn't answer the question i feel like that was all over the place I I, no, no 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 just all right it. And that's not something that's only about artists. I mean, people in yeah. just production jobs or any of the other, other even accounting, sometimes get called into meetings. That yeah, I mean, it, we're, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm not trying to complain about having to go to oh. meetings, but um, there, I think it's just the kind of a little bit of a, a one side. Like you're you're part of the you're part of the company. You're gonna do this thing. We're all doing it. Shut up. Sit down. <laughs> like, and that's okay. I, I didn't I didn't have a problem with that. But on some level, I do kind of like better sort of being on the outside and they're just like, hey, look, you're the guy who's doing this thing. You're doing your own thing. You're out here. We're communicating with you. Like, I'm the art director. I'm talking to you, Cameron, the concept artist. This is what I want. But it's more, it's kind of tailored for you because it has to be, right? Because you are outside the company and you're not in on all the meetings. And so when I talk to you about that stuff, it is just one-on-one. -on -one. So I guess it's kind of a de facto thing. Like, it just has to be that way. But I like it honestly but it's it's been good both ways there's things you got to contend with no matter which way you do so we're going to take more questions from the zoom chat and the youtube chat here in a second but i do have one question that just came up that's particularly about what we're talking about right now um how are you making uh, connections how are you networking especially during this time or even as a freelancer you know how are you getting out there because one thing like i know when i worked at a studio you know, I have 30 people around me. We're all kind of focused on the goal or the end job and we're all, you know, we're talking every day. So, you know, it's pretty easy or, you know, we get invited to luncheons afterwards and I go meet that person's friend and it's really easy in that, you know, sense to um, network even outside your studio. Um, how are you networking right now? So right now uh, I got really lucky after uh, getting let go from picture plane because I had a period where I was just doing a lot of personal work and just kind of put my nose to the grindstone for a long time and just sending out job application after job application and not really getting a lot back from it. And then eventually one of my buddies from picture plane who we, we had both gotten laid off together, his name was Hector Ruiz. He's a really good, uh, really great concept artist and art director. But he was doing some work that he had picked up freelance and he said, hey, uh, we're looking for another concept artist because this project has kind of ballooned. It's become bigger than they thought it would be. And we need someone to come in on us or come in on it with us. And he recommended me for the job. And so I went ahead and I didn't really even have to interview for it because Hector uh, really was my hype man and helped me to, to nail it down. But that was a, a case where, you know, someone who I worked with, who uh, I was friends with and who, you know, I'd obviously been in the trenches with, uh, went ahead and vouched for me and brought me into a job. And from that point, I did a lot of work for that studio. And after that, I don't really know, I, I'd actually be kind of interested in an answer to that question myself, because after I did that job, I got like three or four phone calls in the space of a week and I had been applying for months and months, like for about four or five months before that. And I just kept getting rejected. And then I did a big body of work that I hadn't shown anyone for this other studio that a friend had brought me in on, a friend and colleague had brought me in on. And suddenly I was getting a lot of emails from art directors. So I think I think that uh, Corrigan was the studio that I had been working for that Hector brought me in on to that job. That was a studio called Corrigan and they're an architecture firm in Dallas and Los Angeles and even London, um, or no, New York and London and Dallas. But I asked them after, after the work was done, uh, if they wouldn't mind, just if they thought I did a good job, uh, you know, could they go ahead and spread my name 
uh, anyone in in that field. Like, I because it was it was art biz that I'd done that stuff, and I said, well, you guys do a lot of art biz. I know you have some some competitors, uh, and you have some people that you work with, and that's kind of one of the same in a lot of cases. Uh, but if you could, you know, just say, hey, there's this artist we worked with. We thought that he was really good. Things went really well. And if you don't mind, like, hyping me up a little bit, I'd really appreciate it. And obviously, if you have any jobs that you need me for, I would love to come back and do more work. Because the whole thing was an enormous pleasure, and I loved uh, getting to work with them. But I don't know if it was that they just really helped me out and that they uh, really went and sang my praises to some other studios but there were a few studios from all, all over America that just really quickly were just sending me offers. And it was very straightforward. Like I had a few phone calls and they all just seemed to be sold. Uh, they didn't ask for art tests. They didn't ask for, uh, you know, a, a lot of, basically they didn't, they didn't want me to do a whole bunch of stuff and compete with it. They just said, hey, yeah, we love your work and we think you'd be good for this project. So I'm not 100% sure, but I guess the answer I do have is network with your peers that you do talk to, uh, people who, if you've been in the trenches with them in school or at jobs, um, and you, even if you haven't talked in a while, um, don't be afraid to just say, hey, how's it going? What are you up to? Uh, and if you know, you're looking for a job or you're looking for work, then don't be afraid to just kind of come out and say, hey, man, I'm, I'm really looking for work. Have you had any, any good luck? Uh, are you in a position that you can recommend me to maybe someone you've done freelance for in the past or a studio where you're working now? Because uh, just someone who has done good work vouching for you does a tremendous amount. Uh, and in my case, I, I really reap the benefits from that because uh, I went from having no work to having to choose between multiple jobs. And those were some actual tough decisions because there are some cool things that I could have been working on. Uh, so if you're struggling to find work or network with people, just it's hard to meet people right now, I think is kind of what I'm saying. So any connections that you have, um, try and spark up some conversations. And, you know, don't don't feel like you have to kind of, you know, walk on eggshells around just talking about work. Um, but if there is someone that you haven't talked to in a while, be like, hey, do you want to grab a beer? I'm looking for some work. Maybe we can talk about uh, just what you've been up to and um, we can reconnect and just reconnect with people on the basis of reconnecting like mention the work thing but then just like hang out with them have a beer do whatever uh, and you're just kind of planting seeds and relationships and just fostering those relationships it's like maybe a month or two months from now someone will be like hey my buddy who I was you know talking with the other day would be a really good fit for this and just sort of like be an active part of other artists' lives uh, so that whenever the opportunity comes, uh, they have confidence in you, they know you as a person, and they're willing to vouch for you. I think I think that's a good thing. So if you don't know artists, I mean, you're here, so this is a, a really good place to meet people. Uh, send me a friend request on Facebook. Uh, send me any messages or whatever. We can hang out if you're in the DFW area. But I think just building relationships with artists and art directors. The other thing is just like, you know, send out cold call emails to art directors just saying, hey, I know uh, you're in the area and you do this. If you, And that's that's the same old thing. And I think that is not a bad idea, but it's, it's very conventional and very obvious and it doesn't have a human connection. So I'd imagine the art directors are getting a lot of emails like that right now and you're not really going to stand out. But if someone else gets their foot in the door and they can kind of like, you know, give you a little bit of a, a push and, and vouch for you, that's, that's really, that's impactful. But yeah, it's not very hard right now just to, you know, you see one of your, you know, people that you admire, just a message on say, I really admire your work, you know, Absolutely. and maybe in three months when you do have something amazing to show that you want to critique on just, you know, to build that relationship. I think it's, super easy right now because we are all connected and we're kind of all used to getting messages yeah. you know well, now um, around now it's worse than ever yeah it used to be kind of weird like i don't know you but now it's like well this is the only avenue we have so therefore it's become kind of normal a little more uh which i actually like because i mean i for years have been like contacting people in la and just you know just you know even for the group but like hey would you like to be interviewed for the group or, you know, down the road, you know, would you mind critiquing my work? You know, just tell yeah. me the pulse of the world 
in your neck of the woods. So, uh, yeah, and, this time uh, has its pluses and minuses. Yeah. Uh, Cameron, um, I I know you have another segment or another thing you want to touch upon, or uh, do you want to go in, because we talked about the uh, critique. I just want to make sure. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, if there are any more questions, I can. I can we can get to the rest of the questions. I do want to get into the critique, or if you had any yeah. other segments of your presentation. Um, as far as presentation goes, uh, mm -hmm. I think I think just kind of the idea of, of being able to focus on what you want to say and remain steadfast in it uh, was that's kind of the bulk of what I wanted to talk about. And of course, there's caveats to that, such as uh, up front, scrutinize your ideas and. I, I'm, I'm just trying to reiterate, like, yeah, uh, being able to focus on the best ideas you have, have confidence in them, and through doing paintings throughout that process uh, and doing more paintings, you, yeah, that's basically the gist of what I wanted to say. Uh, but I'll be happy to answer any other questions and do the, the paint over critique whenever you guys are. Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, the reason for that is, well, hang on. I feel like the final poster, hang on. That was just because whenever I was grabbing my images, um, hang on. Yeah, I guess at some point, so uh, there were some images I was pulling from, uh, oh yeah, it was because whenever I had this image, it had industry giants kind of written out like that. That might have been, uh, I might should have split this one. Uh, that was the only reason was that, hang on. Uh oh, Photoshop's kind of thinking for a minute. Here we go. Uh, whenever I had this that I just screen grabbed, uh, rather than have it all backwards because I didn't have this file. Are you guys seeing my screen or not right now? I just realized I might not be. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Okay. So I kind of just decided for the sake of consistency. And so just people would be like, why is the type backwards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, it just, it's a, I guess, a preference thing. I kind of like. Um, just having this guy on this side a little better. It's very much a personal preference thing. But this is how the poster actually kind of ended up looking more or less. Oh, okay. Yeah, because the uh, sun rises in the east or the west. Oh, that makes sense. That's interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it like that. Yeah, we should. So I'll set this up while you get ready, Cameron. Uh, so guys, um, you know, a bunch of short guys, you know, we're a big following here uh, with professionals all over the world. Um, and on our Facebook, it's a great way to connect with everyone. Kind of like what we we're saying, you know, it's easy to, you know, everyone's kind of online, either on our LinkedIn, on our Instagram, our Discord, you know, you can reach out to, you know, any number of our members and just, you know, see what we think, you know, see what the vibe is. Uh, and I always encourage, you know, people getting out there and showing off the work, you know, good, bad, work in progress is, you know, just showing work. I hate hearing artists who have a plethora of work and then they've only got one picture on their portfolio. You know, a lot of artists, you know, we've talked to artists like David Lesperance, you know, he, you know, he, he hires, you know, 20 people a, a month. And he's like, yeah, I, the biggest thing I love seeing is the progression of artwork, you know. So um, Omar, just uh, last week, he showed, you know, just the work he had done over a weekend, you know, and was looking for critiques. And, you know, we just wanted to applaud anyone showing their artwork, you know, kind of opening up their veins to us and being like, critique it, tear it apart, you know. Uh, so Omar, thank you for showing this work to us and giving us, you know, another topic. I thought... Hey, we're having a concept artist who's amazing. You know, in a week, why don't we have you come on, guys? If you got any other artwork you want uh, critiqued, you know, put it on the Facebook. Uh, another thing that we're gonna, I'll talk a little bit more about this at the very end, but we are gonna start up kind of a drink and draw type of night, you know, once a month, uh, especially during going into these slower, you know, December holiday months. And you know, if you weren't home before, you'll probably be home um, a little more over the holidays. So with that, uh, Cameron. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's see, also just want to mention if anyone for any reason uh, wants to ever just contact me out of the blue and ask for a payment, I'm really happy to do anything like that. Uh, 
even like Google Hangout chat sessions where we can share a screen. I would be happy to do that also. Uh, but yeah, so Omar, yeah, right. remember, yes. If I could just ask, could you make sure that you speak up pretty, uh, you, you speak up clearly whenever you're doing the critique? We are just yeah, getting yeah. a little bit of feedback, but. Okay. Yeah, if, 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 if ever anything is kind of off or the audio is weird, just mention and I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and scooch up just a little bit to uh, try and cut down on any uh, any fuzziness and I'll articulate clearly. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so there whenever I looked at this painting, the first thing that I picked up on uh, was there are a lot of very samey design choices just in terms of composition. Uh, there's a guy named Alex Sinichal who has a really good gun mode. Um, and I can, I'll actually email you or text you a link, uh, just on Facebook. I'll send you a link on Messenger to his design gun mode. But he talks a lot about this principle of, I think called it sandwiching. And what it is, is it's whenever you have gaps and spaces in a painting that are very samey and are very measured. And it's a thing that you have to work really hard to actually remove from your painting. Like it's a thing that we do intuitively. Uh, and so when I looked at this very lush organic scene, I started seeing just a lot of very samey kind of you know, spaces in here. So like these two are the same, this one's just a little more, this one's about the same. So there's a bit of a progression, but it, it feels very manufactured when you do that. And if you are trying to actually make something that looks manufactured, like a robot or something, that can actually help. But if you're trying to make something that's going to it's going to be working against you, as well as the fact that just these vertical bars are kind of feeling like a little bit claustrophobic and a little bit you know, not a, a peaceful kind of vibe out in, in the wilderness kind of, kind of thing that I definitely think we can uh, improve on that. But I do like just your spatial awareness, kind of uh, the way that this image reads, and you know, kind of following through here. Then you have a little bit of a plateau right here. When you come out, there's some rocks here, and there's this nice waterfall. I do like that read a lot. Uh, I think, however, that some of this space, this stuff over here, and some of this right here, while it's fine for um, just basically framing that composition and that eye path. Uh, there are some things that I can definitely suggest that I think will, uh, will kind of improve some issues. Um, really quickly though, I'm going to share an artist with you um, who I think you should definitely check out because part of the thing, whoops, hang on. part of the thing that Ben and I talked about a lot was, like I said, precision. And there's this artist named Douglas Henderson, and I'll text you that also. I'll, I'll send you that on Messenger. And Douglas Henderson is a prehistoric artist. He's an illustrator who did a lot of, or does a lot of dinosaur stuff. But his uh, his trees are incredible. Like just how much character and believability and specificity his trees have is just really nuts. And I'm going to get back out to his. Uh, his main page, we can go to the Triassic theory really quick. But he has, actually, you know what, I have something prepared. I forgot about this. Uh, he has all these really nice little details that are just so believable and grounded in his trees. And those are the sorts of things that on like a big graphic level, a big picture level, you don't want to think too much about that. If you're going to boil this down to its base essentials, then this is a beam right here. This is just a line, and these are different thicknesses and all that. But once you get to the stage where you're at, and you really can start to put in color and material treatment, um, just kind of, and this one's kind of grainy, but just looking at specific reference and getting really good reference, which this guy does. Um, like, I was looking at these trees right here. These kind of remind me of the ones in your painting. And like they go straight up, like for instance, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be talking about, I'm going to get rid of these real quick. This I don't way. think we're seeing your cursor right now. And oh, you're just, not? are okay. you in Photoshop? Okay, I see, I see. Okay, so if you're not seeing my cursor, let me, uh, let me describe this a little bit. There we go. We, we see it. We saw it for a sec. 
Oh, okay. Well, I'll just go ahead and highlight this, and I'll, uh, yeah. I'll screen grab this. This will work for me. Yeah, so, do that. So right here, these trees that are right here, these kind of tall, you know, uh, skinny trees, Whenever I first looked at this, I thought, you know, it would be a good idea to go ahead and make them just more kind of swoopy and organic. And then I thought that maybe you had chosen this for a reason and you wanted some of those. Can you camera? Yes. You probably need to switch back to Photoshop as you change to the project. Whoops. I'm yeah. sorry. This is hey, record, I yeah. do that all the time in class, so don't, no worries there. Cool. All right. So here we go. Here we go. Now, now that you know what you're talking about. <laughs> So these trees right here, these specific trees, uh, and whenever I first looked at this, I just thought, you know, okay, these are just up and down, very, very straight towards uh, vertical bars. Let's go ahead and move them around. But then I started thinking about Douglas Henderson's art. And Douglas Henderson has a lot of these, I don't know what they're called, Mexicans. I don't know what they are, but they're very distinct trees. And he paints them very precisely, and they're very cool. And I thought maybe that was what you wanted to do. And if I changed your painting, you'd be like, well, that wasn't my intention. You kind of fixed something on some level, but you also did something very different than what I wanted to do. So looking at these, and hang on, I'm going to grab one. Oh, yeah, I have this PSD. Uh, looking also at these right here, I'm just seeing a lot of these little, whoops, I'm get my layer all the way at the top. I'm seeing kind of Oh, um, hang on. I'm, I'm gonna... Why you figure that out? Uh, one, one thing I'm noticing, you know, with his work is he's very, he's using his shapes um, very contrast like. Uh, they're clearly defined where they're at. Uh, yeah. They're not getting muddled, I guess. Yeah, there's a good uh, foreground, foreground, background read for sure. And so, just kind of taking that, looking at how he kind of is painting some of these trees, and also, uh, I would just get a lot of this reference. So, for instance, um, with some of these right here, I'm just going to copy this back in. Um, oh, that didn't, that didn't just the way I can. And then, there we go. Okay. Um, looking at kind of some of these little details and it's the way these kind of jut out at like almost antagonistic directions. They just they feel very uh, like they're gonna be there doing their thing whether or not you designed that way. Like you're obviously painting these trees for nothing for the purpose of lighting the eye. But having them be just just organized but chaotic enough to where it feels like, you know, they are they exist in the world because uh, weather conditions, and it doesn't matter for the sake of this picture if we're going to do what we want or not. Uh, and just sort of get these straight angular trees and start playing with them, but kind of break up some of those, uh, those spatial relationships a little and get to some of these smaller kind of tertiary details out that really, and also these are going to be jutting straight out. So like, I'm not, you know, doing like these I'm focusing more on getting these to look like sharp and spiky. Like you wouldn't want to touch these, you wouldn't want to try find these. They're pretty impressive. Uh, and in the in the case of your painting, you might want them more organic. And I'll pull back from that. But just on a macro level, I want them to feel kind of unique from uh, the trees. You know, the the tree that is in the this, this thing right here. I want it to feel pretty unique from that. And so just to sort of help with the composition. I'm going to go ahead and just make them as distinct and as specific as I can. Maybe there's one that's falling down, and kind of catching the water there. Um, and I'm going to flip the canvas a lot. I flip the time. And there was a picture of and people really didn't like it because uh, I would flip something and forget to flip it back and then show it to them. And they wouldn't know what they were looking at. And they would think, oh my god, what have you done? And I was like, oh, I flipped it. And like, oh, okay. We all share the same files, obviously, so that freaks people out a lot. But I flip stuff all the time, like every minute sometimes. Um, not necessarily that often, but flip it a lot. And then as we get kind of down lower, I'm gonna, there are going to be fewer trees that are going to actually grow this tall. There's going to be a lot more trees and little brambles that are going to be down here. And that's going to kind of provide some interesting vibration. 
And so that's just a thing. You know, look at nature photos and really try and interpret what you're seeing. And that's how you paint really specifically and you paint really convincingly. So that's just a different framing device. I'm actually going to try and blot out some of this because I don't want there to be too many just kind of same spaces in here. Um, but this is the sort of thing that, I can like that. This is the sort of thing that you'll just kind of push and pull and you know, just, just kind of figure out what you want where you want it. So right there, that's, uh, that's a little bit. And I'm just going to go ahead and block transparency by hitting the little uh, forward slash key. And then I'm going to grab, uh, I have some good brushes here for doing environment stuff. So I'm just going to go ahead and grab a little nature brush. I'm using Sparks brush pack. I'm just going to grab one of these and turn it on to color dynamic real quickly. And let's kind of grab some this. And be a little bit brighter than that. And I'm just going to go ahead and sort of add a little bit of texture. Like this is really fast. This is really rough. Actually, I actually want to turn it on. Right there. I'm going to turn on transfer as well to say Kevin, yeah, right. one comment we've had in the chat was, uh, you, thank you for ex like explaining your hotkeys. Yeah, what was the one you used to flip it? Yes, okay, so there is, as far as I know, there's actually no hotkey to flip out of the box in Photoshop. So uh, what you can do is just say edit, keyboard shortcuts. Well, I meant just like as you're giving Omar his critique, if you wouldn't mind just like kind of oh, yeah. Okay. your hotkeys. Yeah, so I, I set my hotkey up to F2. So if I just hit F2, it flips. And if you just Google uh, how to set up hotkeys in Photoshop or whatever, it's, it's really simple. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's how one to save so much time. Yeah. Also, here's here's one I am going to illustrate how to do this really quick. This is a, an old tried and true trick. Um, oh, well, mine's actually not set up right now. If you go, so perfect. If you go to Window and go to... Let's see. Oh yeah, view, not window. If you go to view and do group setup, you have these options. If you click custom and then go to click this option right here, uh, three conditions of X assimilate, go to working gray, it's right up at the top, working gray dot gray twenty percent and hit OK. If you hit control Y at any time, you can change it from grayscale to color. And you get it really quick. And it doesn't actually edit the file. So if I change this to grayscale, save it, and then open it back up, it's going to open in color because I haven't changed the file. I've just changed the way I'm doing it. Right. So that's really handy. In fact, with that, I'm going to come over here. And to kind of get that foreground, low-ground, background back in play, I'm going to just lighten some of this. Um, and I'm using this, this brush purely for aesthetic to just give it some texture. This is handy because you don't have to go on Google and get photos. Uh, and photos are, you're getting free precision and you're not having to work for it. So actually just kind of identifying how to use uh, brushes and a big thing, letting the brushes do the work for you is a big part of this. Uh, so that's about, that's about like that. That's fine, like that, okay. Also, one thing that I'm just realizing I did that I didn't know I had done before I opened this, I took the little guy in the boat and I just made a selection on the original base layer, and I hit Shift F5, and it brings up this content aware box. Where that guy was, he was right in the middle. Hang on, I think I can actually find. So I actually edited that. Um, although I can bring it back really quickly just to show everyone. Yep, this is a little bit hurtful. Never mind, forget you saw that. Anyway. Um, I apologize for the fact that I can't get that origin with that, but there's a little guy in the boat here. The only takeaway from that is that he was right smack dab in the middle, and I wanted to go ahead and move him somewhere else, so I just took it out, because it was a little bit too fainting, and mentioning that, I'm also feeling there is uh, this line, this dividing line, where this tree is, is smack dab in the middle of the image, so I'm just going to really quickly think that out a little bit. Uh, I'm just going to get rid of that and think that back just a little bit. And this is really rough. This is this is just problem solving. This isn't trying to paint water. 
or trying to think through right now. This is just problem solving to push some of this stuff back a little. Um, so that's that's some of that. And I should know that now. But something I noticed looking at this, um, a few things is that uh, there's a lot of detail in areas where I don't think there needs to be. Um, and like for these, this flower, for instance, let's look at that uh, With this flower, for instance, I'm just going to go ahead and paint over that for now. And you can bring that stuff back, but it'll be much less detailed because right now it sets out as a photo. It can read very clearly as a photo. And you can do that, but you want to wait until later in the paint. I'm going to paint some of this stuff out uh, significantly. And another thing is that focus on using a lot of kind of grays in your painting. Uh, just do saturated colors, um, just to sort of push the color where you use it a little more. So I'm just going to go ahead and push that back there a little bit. Um, and I'll bring those, those flowers back, but I'm going to bring them back like this. I'm just going to I'm going to grab a little bit. I'm going to desaturate this a lot, actually. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and add some of these little things, these are flowers right now. This is this is obviously rough. But these are these are just gonna be uh, little flowers that we have. And um this goes back to what's there. But whenever you have like these blue things right here and this orange thing right here, and then just kind of some separate flowers based on whatever photos are available, uh, everything is kind of less pervasive and grounded. So with these, um, I'll just go ahead and include them in the painting in other places. So I'm just going to do some little brush. It's going to be fun. Um, I'm just going to grab that blue. I'm going to turn on color dynamics. Uh, it's, it's, it's get a little bit of vibration going up and down. There, that's good. And then I'm just going to go ahead and include these things uh, in some different areas. It's kind of around. And I'm also going to turn back on transfer because this is going to be kind of how I can how strong these are. But I'm just going to populate a few little areas with that stuff and you know, put in some places to push them back. But kind of just add some. What? What's that? No, what? I apologize. I was saying I'm just going to go ahead and grab some of this blue. To bring some of these plants in, in in different places and just make them kind of more pervasive to this environment. That's a little too much, but you can kind of play with that and figure out where you want it. Um, but now, uh, as far as the kind of orange tree right here goes, it's kind of a focal point. Um, I want to go ahead and give it a little bit more. A little bit more um, volume, but also where it is right now. I'm going to try and there we go. I'm, I'm pushing this back because I don't want the middle of the painting to line up right at the middle. So right now we're going to have kind of this right here, which is just a little bit kind of lines up with that middle. I'm going to push it over just a bit. So I'm going to paint some of this over that into here and I'm going to grab this and I'm just going to go ahead and we're going to paint the black and white too. Yeah, here we go. That's, that's not quite right. So I'm just going to go ahead and use local color and simplifying a lot of this stuff will help you too. So I'm just going to paint out a lot of these details and it can be kind of hard Whenever you know you spend time getting photos in there or painting in there, you know, saying like, oh, I'm going to simplify it by just getting rid of a lot of information, that can be kind of hard to commit to. Um, but if an area is just overly complex, uh, it's going to, it's just going to make your painting better if you clear it up and if you work on getting that unnecessary information out of there. And so, what I want to do is I want to go ahead. Uh, and really just guide the eye towards that waterfall and have these be framing devices. Because the waterfall, to me, is kind of the story of this painting, or this character is going down uh, this river towards this waterfall. It's, just, it's a nice little sort of pleasant focal point. Um, and so there's some things I'm going to do, like just to kind of imply scale. 
I guess some ripples here. And because uh, this is going to be closer up than this. Like, you know, for instance, these things happen here, they're just going to be closer than this. So they're going to get smaller. Uh, a really nice way to do that, that you're already kind of working with, is there these rays that have really pads on them? So you just wanted to make your brush white, maybe maybe take it a little bit down from white, just so it's not. Uh, maybe go ahead and just grab Hey, uh, <clears throat> Cameron, this is Jay Shu, really quickly. First of yeah. all, I want to say thank you so much for speaking today for Short Guys, and, and huge thanks to Daniel and Marshall and Abby and everybody who helped put this together. So thank you for your time. I love what you're doing here. I actually think the community could use more of what you're doing, of having like practical examples that people present and kind of saying, hey, what are some considerations and things that you could think about? Because yeah. when it's your work, I think there's kind of like this little bit of thing, well, he's the badass, you know, I, I can never get to his giant awesome robots and everything. But when you see somebody like a student present work that needs critiques, uh, you, you're you're helping them refine kind of their idea and getting it to a better place. So awesome. I, I think maybe we should consider actually doing some more of this kind of tutorial critiques like you're doing. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. I've got to jump to another meeting. By any chance, are you on LinkedIn? Uh, I am, yes. Okay, I'm, I may reach out to you, but uh, much appreciated for your time. Guys, great job today. Uh, have a great uh, Saturday and weekend. Yeah, thank you do the same, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for coming in, yeah. Thanks, Jay. The great Jay Shu, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Cameron, yeah. while, while we let you work, uh, do you mind if we, we go ahead and get into some of the questions? Because uh, yeah, I know we got a bunch of questions. Uh, Tatiana is on here. Uh, she was one of our artists for our demo day at uh, the winter party. So I want to get uh, jump the ball off to her and let her ask her question. Sure. Oh, uh, hello. Um, I'm loving this. This is awesome. Uh, you do really good work. Um, I just I was curious. You have so many different clients uh, that um, you know. There's a lot of different styles on there. I just was wondering if you had a favorite kind of client or favorite type of style you like working on, since you do so many. Yeah. Um, right now, I really am enjoying doing kind of. I just did a lot of kind of grounded, realistic sci-fi stuff. And I really like that because I've been getting super deeper into Blender. And Blender is nice because you can just model uh, really quickly, you can model very realistic, like lighting, shading, materials. You get everything looking, uh, it won't look like a photograph or anything, unless your job is to make it look like a painting. But you can get a lot of information that, uh, the computer can do a lot of that work for you. And then you can, can you, focus on the graphic design and the fun stuff. Can you speak but, up, Cameron? You're mumbling okay. up. Yeah. I'm sorry. How's this? Is that better? Cool. So uh, I like doing kind of, I guess sometimes uh, I like both. I like doing kind of map painting uh, layout shots. I also like doing really graphic uh, flat shapes and colors. I had to pick one thing. I really like graphic flat shapes. I don't get to work a lot that way because most people don't want that. But I really just did minimalism and character design. Uh, like Richard Lyons is one of my favorite characters. Oh, artists. he's so, I think he was a short guys presenter. He was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my question last time I was there, it was really cool. Um, but I like doing science fiction. I like doing uh, specifically things that kind of don't exist or kind of more, more than mood paintings, which that's sort of what everyone likes doing. Uh, but really, uh, my favorite style or my favorite way to work is just to be able to kind of do things from the ground up a little bit from the blue sky stage. You don't always get to do that. Uh, but I really like kind of working from simplicity to getting details more. Uh, then just kind of one of the things you know, that I was at picture plan that I did that I'm just noodling on this waterfall. You know, you know. One of the things I did a lot of at picture plan was kind of pixel pushing and so it was random pixels around because there was this big finish damage um, that had been approved and we were just making slight changes and that, that sucked. That was a thing I did not like at all. So getting to actually design is the funnest thing. And with things that don't exist, like for fantasy or science fiction, 
uh, the sky is the limit. And that's that's been my favorite thing about working for you know kind of creative game fun type so is that you're you're doing something that maybe can't exist or at least not the present technology or whatever. Um, and yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. Uh, Cameron, thank you. I, I'm sorry, Tanya, does that answer your question, Tatiana? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for asking. One thing we did want to definitely do is, uh, as you are working on Omar's piece, I did want to see if we could give him a chance to actually just ask any specific pointed questions that he might have as you're working. Omar, did you want to, is there anything that you wanted to ask us, you know, as, this is your piece? Well, for now, I'm just like really observing, like <laughs> I don't know what to ask, but um, really just, can y'all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, I just really feel like, cause I was really struggling on the the tree, the three trees that I had, cause I tried making branches and leaves, but it just looked so bad. So in the end, I just decided to, to um, just pick a stock free photo for the background instead, and I just went with it. But I feel like now since I'm seeing you doing everything, it's just really helping a lot, just figuring out the things that I could have done. So thanks a lot for that. The one thing that I did want to ask you is, um, so like whenever I'm like browsing through art station, you know, portfolios and stuff of professionals. Like I do see like, so you see some portfolios, they have like fully painted, fully rendered environments. And then some people have like breakdowns as well. So like, um, as far as your experience is concerned, what do you think would be like a better approach when you're just starting out? Like as far as just say, like, presenting your work or as far as actually like- kind of the, Like the, presenting your work on a portfolio, like the format, yeah. if that matters. Well, something that I've seen a lot of artists do that I think looks pretty sharp is, and it depends on where your skills are, um, but there are a lot of guys who will do kind of a drawing before they even touch the paint, and they'll just really lay in uh, their composition and their details with the drawing, and that there's a room for a whole like, lecture on that or whatever, but what I mean by that is like, you know, so instead of doing these just really kind of blocky, blobby tree shapes, say with, you know, very minimalist, you know, kind of do some of this sort of thing and get some of these trees going. And they draw a lot like this, like just very, like just straight lines kind of flowing together. Um, and there's not too much, it's almost, for me, it, it, it's kind of hard to even think about uh, it, they're designing pretty much with lines. Does that make sense? And anytime I see someone be able to kind of like uh, provide line art along with their painting, it just looks super pro in my opinion. Um, and you can kind of fudge with a painting a lot and sort of arrive at a conclusion that looks good almost by luck. But if you do a drawing and the drawing solves all the design problems and the drawing uh, really kind of sets your, your sight on what you're doing and then you follow through and execute it with paint. Presentation wise, I think that just kind of says something because ideally if you're good at painting, you should pretty much play those say you drawing with paint. But that's not really the way a lot of people do paint. Um, and so if you can just sort of back up your, your design skills just with some drafting and show that along with your painting, I just think it looks kind of old school and it just looks like you mastered something a lot more than just like because with a painting you don't really have something to write for it. They could have used a bunch of photos and then smudged them together. With a drawing you're more or less designing a line. And at that stage uh, I think it just requires a lot more mastery to kind of wrap that together and put a bow on it. And uh, that's something that takes time. I would just say kind of be be maybe thinking about that with the next thing that we start, like, you know, how can I, I'm going to try not to wrangle real bad, uh, and I'm sorry if this isn't helpful, because this is something that would, would be more easily illustrated with a portfolio of values, taking it as a craft line. Um, but one of my teachers just drew in a way that was clearly, he drew as a design tool rather than to make a pretty drawing. I never seen, and I never registered with when people would do that until then. So if you can show the actual drawing, rather than just my pencil, put my black and white from that it's very graphic, that's cool. A lot of people do that. If you can actually tie a drawing together, a really loose drawing, like, you know, the way I was describing, kind of some 
some rocks, and they have like a rock shape here. And this, and this also actually shows, the reason I think this looks better, if you can do it right, is because it actually illustrates that you're thinking about playing. It actually kind of illustrates that you're thinking about the way that these objects are catching light before you start painting them. You're kind of doing a lot of work up front that you're going to have to do anyway. And that's something that I need to work on myself. Um, but kind of having, having this sort of a plan that's set out in stone from the outset and just showing that as well as maybe a graphic thumbnail. Because those graphic thumbnails, just the back and forth again, ideally should not take you long. So if you take that and then start sort of drawing something out, and like there where there's this rock right here, uh, that top is going to be catching a lot of light. And then kind of this, this side is going to be getting maybe more light with some of this. And you don't have to like have the drawing visible in the front of painting. But being able to kind of wrap that up and present that, uh, I think this shows all our problem solving skills that we might take for granted or not even assume that someone had used at all. And if you're, if you're able to understand that stuff, and then you can also show it off in your portfolio. Um, like, honestly, there are a lot of areas that can use that kind of thing. I'm just going to grab a little bit more value. And that's going to use. And I'm sorry, that, that's sort of, as far as presentation, um, for doing environments, I just think showing that you understand the perspective, you understand the lighting, and you kind of understand uh, level design also is really important for that stuff. And I know, actually, no, I'm rambling a little bit right now, so I'm trying to bring the light in. Um, if, you're, if you're doing this image, making a pretty picture and, you know, kind of like getting something that looks serene or tranquil or whatever you want to look like. That's that's awesome. That's in some ways the final goal. But in like a game, for instance, uh, this is actually going to be an environment that a character is going to move around in. So if you can think about sort of where the character would be going and actually this waterfall, for instance, it's kind of a thing. It's, it's sort of uh, a prop at the end of this river for your character to be moving towards. And uh, doing that kind of thing, like having good elements to guide their eye, it's sort of those elements are then going to guide the player if they're moving through an environment. So maybe take these orange trees right here. And I mentioned before, kind of taking these blue flowers and putting them around in some other places. Maybe bring some of these little red trees or these orange trees kind of up in here, and now the perspective is also changed. So, and again, like this is going to be getting a lot of light right here. This is in shadow, so if this one is desaturated and cooler, this one is warmer, and uh, obviously up here. But, and this is a little bit too light for that atmosphere. But, let's see, let's go ahead. Maybe a little bit, a little bit more warmth there. But, but, uh, but um, just sort of moving, moving these around through your scene, kind of where areas of interest are going to be, I think is just kind of a good way to show your thinking about a little bit about level design. I'm actually going to have some guys, real quick. I'm not to interrupt, Cameron, but yeah, yeah. Uh, Marshall, don't text the group chat, the group text, because Cameron's phone is getting picked up. <laughs> Thank you. Wondering. <laughs> well, you are that too. But uh, another thing that I'm just starting to kind of realize or starting to touch on is that there are a lot of like solid areas in here. And this just sort of pick out a few of these areas in here actually goes like a long way towards uh, kind of improving this depth and perspective and believability. And again, this is like really a principle of working as simply as possible. But, and again, anytime I see a photo right now, I'm actually cleaning it out. Um, you want to resolve everything that was subtle before you start putting photos in, and also really kind of contrast some of these areas. Uh, but picking out some of these negative and positive spaces uh, just kind of helps with giving it that tertiary level of design and detail. Um, get some of this in here. 
And uh, already, I think there's something, I mean, this white is, for, this, for simplicity's sake, you're not supposed to use white a lot, in but that's going to be water. So it's a little bit too bright here. I'm just going to get a color. It is going to be kind of generic to be blue. I'm just going to get a color. I don't know if that's good. I'm going to get a color and just going to put some of that back there. I'm going to go ahead and separate that a little bit from some of the, uh, some of the water. So, okay, there we go. I'm going to flip it again. And let's see. Oh, another cool thing that I'm just going to do really quick. This is, this is kind of a little, little cheat for you. So if you're in the purist in the room, uh, avert your eyes. But if you don't know about this, this is a nifty little technique. Also, I'm getting some nice new yellows and I'm just going to do a little bit of rim light on some of these seeds here. This is not the perfect seed. Cameron, do you, do you mind if we uh, get a few more questions in? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure, I mean, yeah. We're coming up to a two hour mark, so I oh, want to make sure these sorry. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Abby, uh, do you have questions from YouTube? Uh, at the moment, we don't have any questions from YouTube, but we did have another one in the Zoom chat from Morgan. Okay. Uh, and uh, Morgan asks about uh, how do you know you're skilled enough to start being a freelancer and be financially stable? Okay, uh, that's an excellent question. And there's a very short answer to that. And it's that you just kind of have to do it and hope for the, the you, you have to, actually now there's, there's a little bit more depth to it. Go on to, this is, this is all for this is, this is, I think, a pretty fair assessment. Go on to a studio that you like, like go, go find MG or uh, CD Project Red or whatever. Uh, find their staff on ArtStation, go through some of their artists and pick one that's like a local studio. Don't pick Bungie or CD Project Red, like good lord. Uh, pick like a local studio, someone that's not like super duper AAA and find someone there that's doing work that you're like, hey, that's pretty good. But also be willing to kind of look at their their least artists, like their, their most basic introductory artists, and just look at those guys. Find find kind of the guys that you think, okay, they're obviously good, but they're not, you know, John or Jared. Like they're not someone that just makes me never want to draw again. They're the kind of person that I can think I could probably do that if, you know, I just really hustled over the next few months or next year or whatever. Find an artist like that, compare your work to them, compare your portfolio with their portfolio, and do that with, like, a bunch of different artists. And once you get to a point where you think, like, all right, I'm, I'm able to start hitting that mark, that quality mark, um, just start sending your resume around. And if you get some responses, then, you know, the proof is in the pudding. People are looking at the work thinking, hey, this is this is pretty good. Uh, we'd be interested in talking to you. And if you don't get any responses, to me, I don't get discouraged. Uh, just understand that they might, you know, you might still have uh, some distance to go, but also you may very well be absolutely good enough. Ask people in your life, ask artists to know, you know, hey, what, where do you think I'm at? Do you think I'm on track? Uh, do you think I'm at a point where I can market myself? Because there's a thing, in case you haven't ever heard of it, called imposter syndrome that every artist struggles with. There are people that have been working for decades that just think, like, I can't do this. I'm not, I'm not good at this anymore, you know, or whatever. Uh, and that, that impacts students, too. If you can find a good gig to get your foot in the door and someone wants to pay you to do designs, even if you have to take uh, less money than you would ideally want, um, don't, don't let anyone walk all over you. But if you're, if you look at your work and just be very fair, be very critical of yourself, but be fair. Be fair both in your favor and your detriment. Be fair from an employer standpoint and from your standpoint. Say, I'm not where I want to be. I have a lot of things that I want to pick up, but I've come a long way and I think I'm I think I'm doing okay now. Like I'm I'm pleased with, with these pieces that I have in my portfolio. I'm pleased with what I'm able to do in an evening or an afternoon. Um, and I'm going to put myself out there and I'm going to try and find work. I'm going to work really hard. And if I get a gig, great. If I end up getting laid off, 
maybe they didn't like it, maybe I asked too much money, maybe that maybe they just didn't need me for that duration of time. But you just kind of have to hope for the best and give yourself a fair critical analysis and work hard because you're never going to feel, you're never in your whole life. There's, there's a story I heard of a European portrait painter. I don't remember his name, but the dean of my school told me this story. And they interviewed one of the premier portrait painters in the world. And this kind of goes back to that humility thing. Uh, and they said, you know, wow, you're, you're, you've been ranked by the Academy, like whatever, there is a portrait painters union or guild or whatever. Uh, you've been ranked as one of the best painters alive at portraits. And he said, you know, no, no, that's, that's not true. And they said, no, what, what would you, like, what would it take for you to, you know, agree? And he said, maybe if I had another, maybe 200 years of learning, I could get it to be one of the best alive. Maybe 200. And they laughed at it. And, but I'm sure that's how he felt. And it's because the better you get, the more you surround yourself with people who are, you, you keep leveling up. And so the competition gets higher. And so you're always permanently going to be feeling like you're less than you probably are. You're always going to be more critical of yourself. You're your own worst enemy. Um, so as long as you are critical and as long as you are fair and you try and keep a very realistic assessment of yourself, just go out there and do do your best. Like go out, be the best, do your best, work hard, play hard. Uh, and for me, I'm I'm kind of lucky because for me the. Uh, Freelancing is just nothing changed for me through COVID. Like just waking up and, and painting all day, and that was what I was always doing. Uh, I wasn't going out a lot. I'm sort of a homebody, and so I, I knew a lot of people that were saying like, you know, oh, this is terrible. I'm, I'm going insane. Nothing really changed for me personally. Um, I'm not saying you have to be like that, but. If you are, maybe freelance is a really good option. As far as studios go, you're really going to struggle to get into a studio uh, just because that's how it is. I recommend trying to freelance before going into a studio because studios, unless they're contracting, which is kind of the thing with freelance, unless they're contracting, um, in my experience, A, they want you to be super niche. They want you to do one thing. So if I was going to be an environment artist, I would need to be environment because I'm a high side in my head. I would just need to paint environment all day. I did characters and I did uh, poster art and stuff like that as well. It's my experience that some art directors look at that and it's almost a detriment. Like they think that you're trying to do too much or maybe they just think that you're not a specialist in that field. Um, so if you want to be a freelancer, if that's something you want to do, I found that versatility is good for that. If you want to be a studio artist and say you look at uh, Destiny or Halo, and you think that's awesome, that's the kind of concept art I want to make. I want to paint environments for a living. Then, just as someone who's done both, I would tell you market yourself as that, go all in on that, um, and just kind of play to that strength if you want to work in a studio. Because if you do do a lot of things, it's just harder to kind of get people to think you're a specialist at the thing that you or that they want you to do. Um, but yeah. once, once, sorry, that, that was a very long tangent. But yeah, continue. I'm sorry. You're good. And more, I guess, maybe something that would, I'm wondering, could you, uh, while we have a little bit of time, yeah. uh, something that might also speak to Morgan's question is the, the kind of, you mentioned stepping into uh, the perspective or what's important to say the person you're going to for, for feedback and for direction. Um, would that also like when it comes to like just having the mentality of being a problem solver, as far as, you know, when studios are looking for artists, for instance, they're looking for someone to solve a problem yeah. and, or provide a solution or do a service that they can't either do themselves or they don't have time for. Yeah. So are you basically the same kind of the way you talk to employers, be sort of always trying to solve problems before they even come up or I'm sorry, can well, you rephrase the question? I guess what's your, what is your perspective as far as when you're trying to create a body of work and a portfolio that shows that you can be a problem solver in a sure. niche or a specific area or expertise? Sure. Um, so to talk kind of about level of design, um dang i wish i wish i had this guy's name off the top of my head there's a guy who did some work uh i can forward him 
I'll, I'll just try and describe it. It's so with a scene like this, if you really want to sell someone on your problem solving skills and you're just going to knock it out of the park, there's this scene and this scene, like, let's say the camera is like right here. And if you use 3D at all, then like, this is what a camera looks like. And it's just taking that view. So that's cool, but a 3D artist is going to need to actually build this environment. So then, if even an orthographic, if you can, whoops, it's a little even an orthographic, if you can kind of paint just a cross section, just like a cutout of this scene, like this. So let's say here are some of these little cooler things. Here's the waterfall. This is really bad. Uh, but here's the waterfall. I mean, here's like this path, and you go ahead and do this. But you can kind of just paint some rocks here, do kind of a cross section, and pretty much move the camera into another another view, or even within the context of this view. If you can just rotate or pivot the camera to be, you know, over here. Let's say you want your camera over here, and it's pointing in this direction. Um, you know, that can, and then say, what would that look like from that angle? Uh, that sort of thing, that sort of problem solving, just saying, like for instance, what I did with that poster, uh, I had a banner crop and a vertical crop for it. Well, with an environment design like this, like this looks really cool from this angle maybe, but once you move the camera, what's it going to look like? Because the player is going to go over and they're going to stand right here. They're going to stand on this, they're going to stand on this waterfall and look down, what's that going to look like? Is that going to look just as cool as this? And is it going to be consistent throughout these shots so that someone in the 3D department can actually go ahead and start to build this environment? And uh, if you can be thinking of that ahead and really iron out the wrinkles and really kind of put forward, like, hey, this is my plan for this environment. Instead, this is just my plan for this painting as a singular design. If you can actually... Uh, move your camera around. And this is the thing Craig Mullins talks about. Like, do a film study where you paint from a, a film still, and then do another study where you move the camera somewhere else in that scene and try and paint that and imagine. Uh, and you're essentially doing that whenever you design a level from different angles, is you're just uh, trying to kind of solve problems from all angles. And if you can do that without being asked, or just put that in your portfolio and people see that then they'll just know that you can do that. And that's a big part of the process. So it's, it's a win-win. That's a great answer. It's great advice. Also using 3D, uh, don't, I mean, I, I might say like, don't use 3D too much as a crutch. 3D is just so big now and it's so powerful and it's it's so useful. And it's, I don't even as a crutch really anyway, but if you can use 3D and if you can figure out, this is really important, if you can figure out, and it's, it's not, actually that hard, but if you're not doing it right, it's, it's you know, you're going to be working against yourself. If you can figure out how to block this scene out, like take this thumbnail, like let's just say this is a color sketch, and you want to add a little bit more detail, but let's say, you know, just kind of, you take this scene, and if you can bring this into Blender or Max or whatever program, and build a rough block-in of this scene with your son pointing from the right direction, let's just say your son is going to be up here, and it's going to kind of come through here. Or maybe you want your son back here, and it's going to come through these trees. But if you can just set that up quickly, and I'm talking like within 20 or 30 minutes, maybe an hour, uh, if you can learn how to do that, and then you can use your really rough, basic 3D geo, which when I say basic, I mean what this tree right here is going to look like, because it's going to be that shape. Like, it's going to look like that. It's not going to have any more detail, and then it'll or you can just do that. And then a light will come down and it will tell you exactly how light is going to, and then you can see that light over here. And it's going to really tell you how to make this look natural. And then you can go ahead and really quickly start. Then you're cooking the gas because then all the perspective, all that stuff, so much of that is done for you. And uh, that's a big part of just making it fast to do that kind of level design. At that point, you're pretty much working in the same technique the actual environment artist is going to be working in, which is not taking it nearly as far. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for all that, Karen. Um, yeah, I would say definitely getting feedback 
Uh, I do know an artist that um, he takes interviews every three months. He's worked at the same studio for the past six years, but he takes interviews at different studios just so he can get different critiques from different views in the industry of his work so he doesn't get uh, pigeonholed into yeah. just one style. Uh, but I, I think everything you've said today really speaks to a lot of artists out there. Um, guys, uh, Cameron, I know you can keep on going, uh, but I know some of you guys need to get going. Uh, so all I'm going to say is if you want to carry this discussion, uh, you guys can go to our Facebook, you can go to our Instagram, you can hit the like and the subscribe on the YouTube. So we know we're bringing you content that y'all want to see. If there's artists out there or subjects y'all want to hear about, let us know. I know there's been some chatter about doing some substance designer classes or uh, things like that. Um, just to give you a little more feedback as to what to expect over the next coming months. So we're getting to the holiday season. So we're not going to have any full fledged meetings like today uh, until January, but that January meeting is going to be a virtual production meeting. Uh, we're bringing in a speaker who's worked on huge LED screens like the Mandalorian type of uh, workflow and uh, answering how uh, they're creating sets, uh, virtual sets for final production work. Um, another thing we're working on right now is we're coming up uh, with online sales for our t-shirts and maybe even bringing up online sales for some of our past t-shirts like this one that we did a few years ago. Um, that should be coming up in the next few months. Um, Cameron, uh, can you just restate for me uh, where people can find you? Um, you know, what's the either the best way to look at your portfolio or just to ask you a few questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, probably the easiest way to contact me is by Facebook. Um, I, yeah, just Google Cameron Rick. Uh, literally, the first result is my art station page. It's just the very top Cameron Rick uh, on art station. Um, or to send me a friend request on Facebook. Uh, I'm not on LinkedIn as much as I should be, but more or less Facebook and ArtStation. Also, if you want to follow me on Instagram because you know, I'm 20 something years old and I have to plug my Instagram or whatever, uh, it's just camwit.art on Instagram. And there's like a lot of different kinds of things. I actually, I'll be honest, I kind of in some way pride myself in just being versatile. It's something I was trained to be, and I found out it's a very double edged sword. But since I got it, I kind of flaunt it. And, I think I, I really appreciate all the time you've done. And I know there's a lot of prep time that goes into you know making this happen. And thank you for being um, very approachable through the uh, few months that we've been planning this talk. And I'm glad we finally got to do it. Um, yeah. I think we're going to send you, uh, Omar, I think we're going to send you this final Photoshop file so you can look at it. Um, <laughs> because I know there's just a ton of work that's yeah, gone into this. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you guys can chat, you know, a little bit more, you know, later about this. Uh, but camera, again, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for everyone for joining us. Uh, Tatiana, thank you for coming on. Scott, thank you for coming on. Abby, thank you for asking some amazing questions. Marshall, you do a great tech job <laughs> and make making sure we're on point. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, there, there was he's one like, tech error, so. Hey, it, it was my fault. It was my fault. No, no, so. that was my fault. There was double audio in the YouTube. Hey, we put the Discord um, link to our shirt guys oh, yeah. over on there too. And um, we might hang out there over the holidays. Oh, week, thank right? you so much. Oh, you yeah, I want to mention out that we're going to, yeah, we're going to try to do a couple of little drink and draws or just hang out and chat. And maybe you know, if you're working on something, we can all just, you know, learn from each other, kind of like the little luncheons that we used to do. Uh, but I think this will be a lot easier, especially over the coming months. And hopefully it's actually something we carry on throughout the year as a addition to all the content that we do on this channel. So with that, guys, I think um, I'm just going to say good night, good day. Have a great Saturday. Keep making great art. You know, I want to hear from every one of you. So see you guys. We'll see you, YouTube.